And welcome to Carcon Carne. I'm James Van Ostel. Happy Tuesday night. Carcon Carne is sponsored by our friends at Siren Records, McHenry. They're on Main Street in McHenry. I, I've said it a million times. Really, one of the only places I think I've been in the past 12 and a half months during the pandemic. Uh, it is it is a happy place for me. Old stuff, new stuff, friendly service. If you go in there saying, I really like this kind of band, what else can you point me to that I might like? That's why you go to a record store. They'll point you in the right direction. It's all about that curation. Siren Records, McHenry. Uh, thanks to them for sponsoring the show. My guest tonight, he is, I mean, he is the musician's musician. He is Mars Williams of Grammy Award nominated Liquid Soul, a Chicago legend. And Mars, Lost Soul Volume 1 is this collection of on-the-shelf recordings and performances. Does this mean Liquid Soul is back? Well, Liquid Soul hasn't really gone away. But I guess you could say we're back. Um, we've been playing, yeah, we've been playing on and off for, uh, I think there was only a period maybe around 20 or 2003 where we didn't, uh, I broke it up for a little while. And then, you know, different musicians came in and out of the band and we continued. But, um, you know, I'm on tour with Furs, Psychedelic Furs a lot. Uh, so that takes up a lot of my time. A um, couple of my other side projects I'm doing. So, but when I'm in town, I usually try to book some shows for the band. And the band sounds great right now. So, because of course they do. And I, I want to circle back to Lost Soul. But for people who may not be as familiar with Liquid Soul, which seems unthinkable, but uh, for people who may not be as familiar, let's go back to the beginning. I mean, in the very at the very onset of Liquid Soul, it was you, it was Tommy Klein, it was Jesse De La Pena. At Elbow Room, just this kind of loose, collective, all were welcome sort of thing. Talk about those early days. Yeah, there was. Let me shut this phone off there. Sorry. Um, so the early days, it was, uh, you're right, it was Jesse De La Pena, Turntables, um, Tommy Klein on guitar. And uh, I can get to that a little later because they're actually the, the guys that merged with me and sort of were Jesse was the one that was bringing this whole idea of the acid jazz of um, uh, turning me on to music that was happening in starting to happen in England and New York a little bit with the DJ and live musicians. And he was like at the forefront of that. And, uh, and Tommy was doing some things with him. And I had a group called act of God that was, um instrumental group maybe four or five guys i can't remember exactly and uh those that group so tommy klein was in that also and ricky show walter on bass and um actually dave sycott i think was on drums um uh, angus thomas might have been on bass sometimes angus bangus but um I'm trying to give you an idea of what was happening here. So we, Tommy was like, you know, we should do some, we should maybe try having Jesse in this thing. So we started putting both groups together. So both groups kind of merged. So Tommy and Jesse were doing something at the smart bar, I believe it was as the booty Kings. And it was just, uh, you know, DJ, couple musicians. And then, um, I brought in the group from Act of God, and uh, it became a five-piece group. And actually, some of the songs that were at the beginning of Liquid Soul were Act of God songs that, with the addition of the turntables and what Jesse would throw in there, um, that those were those songs had turned into Liquid Soul songs. Uh, but for the most part. At the at the elbow room, when we came together and played, it was a lot of freestyle jams. Uh, Jesse would throw down a beat. We'd all spontaneously create a song. Um, or the drummer might start it out, or I might start it out, guitar player might start it out. And I believe at the time, Ricky from Active Guy was playing bass also. And uh, the, the original drummer was Tim Mulvena, who was uh, playing sometimes drums, sometimes just percussion along with the, the DJ. And um, 
And then eventually Dan Leali came into the group. So that was the core of the band. You don't mind me keep going on about this? Oh, no, it, it, this was a very organic thing. The, the growth yeah. of Liquid Soul is very organic. So we also were doing things like um, taking jazz standards and putting our spin on it, putting some hip-hop beats behind it, uh, jamming along with them. And we started doing the Sunday nights actually at the Elbow Room because Sunday night was we, – we wanted to do a night – of a residency that we could uh, explore this music, you know, and play together a lot so that it can develop into something. Um, and Sunday nights in Chicago were pretty dead. There wasn't really much going on at that time. It, this is like is 93, it, I think it, it was. Sunday nights an industry night. Right, exactly. So we figured, well, let's get all the guy, all the bartenders and, and bouncers and you know whatever so so sunday night you know it started off few people would come down and we would also invite people to come up and play so it, it was i wouldn't say it was an open mic because we kind of had to approve what was going on but um jesse had a um this blue groove freestyle night I think he was doing. I think that was happening at the time. So he was doing things with some uh, MCs, rappers around Chicago. So he invited some of those guys to come by. So they'd sit in and start rhyming over some beats that we would just spontaneously come up with. And it just started, uh, you know, I, I don't even understand how it, how it started, but pretty soon there was like more people coming into the club, more people coming in the club. And as that happened, more musicians would come down. Of course, it was an industry night, so musicians weren't playing because mm -hmm. a lot of things weren't happening Sunday nights. So they'd come and they heard about the group and um, guys like uh, Frankie Hill, keyboard player, he would come in and, uh, and sit in. And I liked having the keyboard, so he kind of became a member of the band with without officially saying so. <laughs> he was just there every week. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think he brought Ron Haynes in on trumpet to come and sit in one night. And Ron sounded great. And then uh, I, I really enjoyed playing with another horn player. And then Ron came back the next week and the next week. And I said, you know what? We should just keep, I, I like the two horns. So we'll keep the two horns in there. And uh, and to keep going on further, because the first record we did, which is uh, self-titled, just Liquid Soul, um, which was also on the Soul What Records label, which is my label. We originally put it out on that. And, um, and that had that group that I was just talking about. So it was Dan Leali, Rick Showalter, Jesse De La Pena, uh, Tommy Klein, uh, me, and Ron Haynes. And um, and the record was, we had some freestyles on there with some MCs, uh, did a couple jazz standards, just what we were doing on Sunday nights. In fact, some of the stuff was live from the Elbow Room, I believe. Um, and then the band just started growing and the audiences started growing until you know, before you know it, then we had a, a John, John Janowiak Showtime was on trombone. And I then, you know, I get spoiled. I'm also, I'm like, wow, we've got a horn section. I love this sound. And the blend was great between the three of us. So we added that. And, um, and the crowds would just start getting bigger. And, and it became the thing like, uh, Celebrities would come down. All the a lot of the sports guys would come down. Like Chicago Bears, they'd play on Sundays, and no matter where they were, if they were out of town, they'd always fly back to Chicago on the right. the plane or bus or whatever it was, and they'd come down to the Elbow Room and hang out. A lot of them would, and uh, that would also draw some women into the into the club. Oh, and yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying, I bet. I, I bet. Yeah. They... And then uh, the Chicago Bulls, you know, we started getting some of that. And this was even before the Rodman period, which we could talk about later. But, sure. um, you know, uh, Scottie Pippen was down there. But, 
you know, the elbow room had a really low ceiling. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these guys had a little trouble uh, being in the venue. And pretty soon Scotty Pippen, I remember, was uh, would just park his car outside and pick up the ladies that were coming in. Instead of coming down, you just hang out out front. What a life. What a yeah, life. What a life for sure. And you really you realize, Mars, as you're telling these stories. I mean, I, I was in Chicago in the 90s. I remember your residencies at Elbow Room and Double Door. But for a lot of people who weren't here during that time, what you're talking about right now sounds like Camelot. As you're talking about this magical time in Chicago, the Bulls are hanging out, the Bears are hanging out. You guys ended up playing Rodman's birthday party. Th this is like fantasy stuff for people who weren't here. It, it almost everything that happened in that decade in particular to someone who wasn't there seems almost too unbelievable to be true. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I wonder if something like that could happen again now. Right. You know, I think it was just the perfect time for it. And, um, you know, scenes do develop in different cities and kind of organically like this did. And it wasn't like we were setting out for it to be anything big. We just wanted to, you know, work on some music and develop something. And for me, it was a perfect outlet because, you know, if, if you know anything about my, my career, it's, I love playing so many different styles of music. Yep. You know, I'm, I play free jazz. I play funk. I play, you know, sort of Billy Idol, you know, Billy Squire ministry, you know, uh, a lot of free jazz, weird experimental stuff. And, and this was a project that I could kind of put them all together yeah, in some way. And, and that was the concept I was kind of going for. And the, the, basically the common denominator was there had to, that there was a groove over the groove. It's up for grabs. You could put any, anything would go over the top of it. And that's how I was looking at it. That's how I was experimenting with it. And it worked. And, um, and then, you know, we outgrew the room, you know, and, and so many people would come and sit in, you know, like, uh, guys from Cypress Hill and, um, oh God, what was her name? Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But a lot of, a lot of, I think Medeski Martin and Wood would come by soul coughing. I mean, we were bringing these bands in the first time they would come into Chicago. They were like touring. They needed a place to go. And we'd have them as our opening group on those nights. And that was like their, you know, because we had a built in audience already. Right. So um, it, it was uh, it was pretty incredible. Then we outgrew the room and we moved on to the double door. Right. Because, you know, there was lines down the block and we just couldn't let enough people in there. You know, and the room was so smoky and sweaty and hot. and <laughs> Which was part of the appeal, let's be honest. It definitely was. I, and as a musician, as an artist, I'm sure this was a thrilling time. I mean, crowds aside, bears and bulls aside, uh, what an exciting time to work with all these people who I'm sure as you're improvising and freestyling on, on stage, I'm sure they were pushing you in interesting directions. I'm sure you were finding new new things about yourself as an artist as, you, you're, as Liquid Soul was progressing. Oh, Definitely. And, you know, I was learning new things that I, you know, uh, Jesse was definitely turning me on to some different music. And um, and once, you know, it's like you, you find as a band leader, too, you find the strengths in each musician that's that's in the group and. And what they bring to the table. So it's another voice that you're using so when i'm thinking about writing or how the band is developing i'm thinking of each individual voice and how it's going to come together and like what jesse was throwing in there i'd be like okay well i could have that beat over this you know or what jesse did the other night and what we did the other night i think i'm going to develop that more and turn it into a tune instead of just a freestyle you know, because I'll, I'll remember these things or I would record them, which is which. All right. Well, let, let's jump ahead. We can jump back. That's the beauty of yeah. the podcast. Uh, you recorded so much uh, of what Liquid Soul did on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how percentage wise, how many of those shows do you think you had archived? Um, I said 75 percent, but it might have even been more than that. 
So these are all, uh, these are all dats recorded from the soundboard. You know, this was the '90s, so it was first cassettes. This is before not the, the dats, and then um, uh, then it was probably dats or CDRs, mm-hmm. mini discs. Um, what other format was going on at the time? A dats. All I know is that DATs were the music format of the future, and I think there are only two functioning DAT players in America at this point. Well, I have one, but the problem is, I mean, the problem is, is that it was, it was the, the, you know, the format of the future, and, but the tapes deteriorated. Yep. That I found out. So a lot of those 75% of recordings I have, a lot of them are unusable. That's rough. And so you've been yeah. sitting on these tapes for and CDRs, et cetera, all this time. Had the, had something like Lost Soul been in your head all along? Like at some point, I just want to get some of this stuff out into the universe, some of these archives. Um, it was in the back of my mind as as the years went on. I knew I had this stuff, but I wasn't really think it when I recorded the stuff. It was mostly to for our own purposes to listen back. Sure. To what we did, because every night we did freestyles, even when I was writing songs for the group specifically. We, within each show, we would do two, three, four, four freestyles a night. We still do that. We've always done that and we still do it. And um, so we'd listen back to these things and see where we're going with this stuff, you know, and I'm getting more ideas and then turning those into uh, sometimes we would I'd, I'd record one of the nights and you know I'd remember a certain thing that we did that I really liked and I thought you know this could be developed so I'd go back and listen to it and we do a rehearsal with the rhythm section and uh, we'd work on it and develop a song out of it so you put out lost soul volume one which hints that this is just the tip of the iceberg yes there's a uh, yeah. It, I mean, right now there's two other ones ready to go. And oh I'm thinking that there's probably going to be a fourth and I've got some other ideas too for continuing the series. This is exciting. And it sounds really cool. I mean, it's, it's liquid soul. I, just to jump back a little bit. Let's, let's focus on turn of the century. Let's talk about here's the deal. Okay. Had you any inkling at the time that you would end up in the running? For best contemporary jazz album for the Grammys, no. <laughs> it totally took you by surprise. I yeah, surprise is an understatement. I mean, I never being nominated for a Grammy in any context for me, let alone Liquid Soul, was never even a thought. You know, it was something that I just figured. You know, oh, that's never going to happen to me, or I never even thought that it was never going to happen. To me, because it was never going to happen to me. <laughs> it was that far fetched. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm, I'm trying to think if any other records I've been on were ever nominated. I, th- I think maybe, but I, I'd have to. I know I've been on a couple of records I was on that were nominated, but nothing that was like for major records or anything. I don't even think like, you know, I had thought that Rebel Yell record would have been nominated but i don't think it was even though it was such a huge record for the time um but uh when that happened i got a call from the uh um the president of the grammys here chicago office and he said to me he goes yeah you know i i think i had met him before too and he's like you know we're going to be announcing the um uh, the nominees, you know, the, at the Chicago, you know, office, when they're being announced, we're all going to be there. And, you know, you should probably come down and, you know, just make an appearance, you know, it'll be good for your PR and what, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, you know, sure. Why not? I'll go down there, you know? And I, I didn't, I still didn't, it didn't, didn't dawn on me. And apparently, I mean, Again, it was so far fetched and such. It wasn't even in the back of my mind. It was like uh-huh. some other place. But uh, apparently, if you're called to go down there, you're going to be nominated. 
but I didn't know this. So when I was there and Common was the one who was reading off the nominations and he read off Liquid Soul, I, I was just like, this has got to be a mistake. <laughs> you, know? you guys, uh, I think you should read that card again, you know, but it, um, yeah. And you know, what, what's really funny is that the manager I had at the time uh, from Billions, he, when I left there, I called him. And I said, hey, you know, we just got nominated for uh, um, Best Contemporary Jazz Album. And he's like, oh, no, no. He goes, you mean <laughs> you were you were nominated? It, it was like in the, you, you know, when they eliminate and they eliminate and it goes to different levels. Yeah. So then there's like 36 that break down to five or whatever. Right. So you're, you're like some preliminary round of voting. You made it that far. Exactly. Yeah. That's what he thought it was, like the preliminary thing. And and I'm like, no, no. And he's like, no, no. You, it was just a play. I'm saying, no, man, we got nominated. And I'm like, I, I know what you mean because it's it's a little far fetched. But but really, if you think about it, you know, I mean, it's an honor because it's it's you're being nominated and voted by your peers, right? You know, which is pretty incredible. So just the idea that all these people even knew of us was amazing to me, and. But, you know, I when I think back on it and I see the stuff that's being nominated over the years, I think it was, I, th I mean, it was cool we did, but I, I could see that it was a, a good thing for its time too, because the music was different. We, we sort of established a sound, a Midwest. Yes. Uh, acid jazz sound because it was like no other acid jazz music in the world liquid soul had the chicago sound well and it was so mass appeal and not mass appeal like britney spears at the time but mass appeal in that football players from the bears hipsters from wicker park people from the suburbs all got it mm -hmm. like it, it spoke to everyone it had it just it was able to touch all those different lifestyles and interests that was cool and you're yeah. right it was a very midwestern thing and when you look at doubt at our at our audience, it was there was such a mix. And I was just talking to somebody about this recently. It was, you know, every race was represented. There was every genre of music that we mixed in there. So you have like guys that were there for the jazz element of listen to the horn players blowing. They'd be off to the side, just like sitting there grooving and listening. We'd have the the hip hop crews coming in there and you know you know listening to the the, the hip-hop element of what we're doing the dance crowd um it was it, it was incredible i mean it, it was such a an awesome vibe in the rooms it was great and again the, the turn of the century period at, the, at that same time uh roughly the same year you got nominated for the grammy there you are opening for sting in central park was that your biggest gig at that point um well yeah that was definitely the biggest gig as far as audience attendance and things like that because it was like i don't even know how many you know, eighty thousand or something like that but um you know there was there were a lot of highlights that was an incredible moment for sure i bet um but you know, we also did Madison Square Garden twice with, with Sting. And those were incredible nights. Um, we did Newport Jazz Festival, the first band of our of our genre. Mm -hmm. to You know, first as a jazz band to ever play Newport Jazz Fest. And then we did the Newport Jazz Fest in Japan, the JBC Newport Jazz Fest in Japan. And that was like, that was incredible. You know, I met... Uh, Roy Haynes, you know, who was like this God drummer, you know, that was, mm -hmm. it, it was incredible. And uh, so, God, there's so many, I, I, I can't, you know, I'm sorry, but it, there's so many that were amazing gigs and it was just uh, the whole, the whole experience of being out there on tour and, 
you know, we're playing our original music and we're doing something that we love and we're, we're jamming, you know, and we're playing to, you know, festivals, you know, 20,000 people. And it, it was, I mean, it, it was I'm getting goosebumps remembering those times, you know, it was just incredible. And there you are, this group of people creating music for music's sake. Exactly. And being successful on those terms. that That's the American dream if you're a musician. Mm-hmm. And you guys did it. And you're still doing it because this collection, uh, Lost Soul Volume 1, is accessible. And it, it's a it's a peak. It's live stuff and it's some studio stuff, too. Yeah, the studio stuff. You know, when I was digging through the tapes, um, I was mainly looking for, you know, it, it was a lot of listening because I'd have to listen to all these shows and try to find... I was looking for freestyles because I'm like, well, I don't want to release stuff of us playing the same songs, same songs that are on the records. And um, so I was looking for freestyles to, and uh, I'd, ru- I'd find these tapes that I'm like, wait a minute, this was like recorded. We would do recordings for the rec for the albums, the way we did it to capture the, the vibe of what the band was and the energy of what the band was. Most of the stuff that we recorded, we got uh, Metro Mobile, which was a, a recording truck that would pull up in front of Double, Bo- Double Door, run a cable out there, set up microphones on the stage, and we'd be recording to tape, actually, the two-inch tape back then in the truck. And uh, we'd record the sound check. Um we record the show like two or three sets a night and everything was tracked. And then we keep the stuff set up. And then the next day on the Monday morning, we come in there and we play again in the room. So we're playing live in the room. There won't, there was no people there though on the Monday. Um, then we would take those tapes and bring them into Rack's Track Studios at that. That's yeah. At that time. And uh, and listen to them and say, OK, well, you know, let's add some more horns here or let's um, put some vocals here, do something, you know. So but the basic rhythm tracks and a lot of the soloing and all that stuff was the basic stuff that we used on the record. And I'll, I'm telling you, it sounded so incredible. Uh, Tim Powell, the guy from Metro Mobile, who's done, you know, the Stones, they used to pull the, they went on tour with the Stones with that truck, you know, and and so many records. He said that the best sounding record that he's ever done is that Here's the Deal record, the one that was nominated. Yeah, I I trust his, uh, trust his opinion. Yeah. So a couple nights ago on my radio show, I played Double Pump. Where did that come from? That was... I think it happened exactly what, what I'm telling you now. So I think it was, I think it was, it might've been a sound check. Or I can't remember. Is there an audience on it? <laughs> no, it must be. Yeah? A, it's no? A sound check. no, it's a sound check. Okay. It's a sound check. I, I probably listed that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a sound check. Okay. I don't even remember what, what everything was. Um, so yeah, so we recorded the sound check at Metro Mobile, took the stuff, maybe spice it up in the studio and that's just a rough mix really so you know and i just happen to have the rough mix on a a cassette or a dat or something that i found and i'm like well we don't really oh and at that time with double pump that's when the format again switched even with major recording stuff so people weren't even using two inch tape anymore Mm -hmm. very rarely analog so it was all digital so they were using um Again, the formats changed all the time, but there was ADATs and DA88s, which were uh, basically like a VHS tape that would record audio. And you'd have eight tracks on each one. So you'd have three machines synced up to each other, which those tapes forget about trying to recover those. Uh You you can't play. There's those definitely there's probably two machines in right. the world to get. And those, tape, play- those tapes are just doorstops at this point. Exactly. I mean, I've got them. 
but if you play them, they're just going to get eaten by the machine uh -huh. pretty much. You know, I mean, I might as well try it because, you know, they're no, they're no good anyway. So right. if you're expecting to lose it anyway, give it yeah, a shot. Exactly. Unless, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping somebody's going to come up with some way of salvaging these kind of tapes, you know, but I doubt it at this point. Um, but uh, so we recorded it. And uh, so I knew that we couldn't go back and remix this stuff because I didn't even know where these tapes were, mm -hmm. but I'm like, you know what? This sounds, sounds great. You know, for what, what I want to do. Cause lost soul series is, is, is like a retrospective of the band an oral retrospective mm -hmm. of the band that shows the progression of the, of what we were doing, you know, from the elbow room into the double door, and I don't have it listed like that. Like I don't start like volume one from the elbow room or anything like that. It's all kind of mixed up. Um, in fact, I think the latest one on there was from the Abbey pub in like 2013 or something like that. Right. So, um, but it just shows the, it, I wanted to feel the energy of what was going on on those nights. And I hope we captured it. Oh, you nailed it. You know, yeah. you mentioned all the different people you played with from you know, ministry to Billy Idol, Billy Squire. Uh, this tells me two things. One, you're a fantastic player. Two, you play well with others. Is, is that a Midwestern thing, your congeniality? Um, you know, I've been, uh, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for everybody else. Uh, but I, I've been, I, I'm really grateful because I've been able to, go into these situations and play the way I play and bring what I have to them. And, a, you know, I conform, I play according to the situation. You know, that's just, I mean, I'm a professional musician, so I'm going to play the situation, but I'm putting my voice into there. It's not like if you're a studio musician and you get called to do a record and you go in and play and you're playing this, you know, thing that they exactly want you to play and do this. It, it's, I, I've been really lucky in that I get to bring my style and sound into these projects. So, you know, it's, it, it's pretty cool. So last year, Psychedelic Furs released Made of Rain, mm -hmm. uh, which the first song on that album, The Boy That Invented Rock and Roll, if that isn't a live music show opener, I don't know what is. Yeah, that, that that's made for a show up and you're in there a little little underneath everything. But that, that is just, the whole album is great. Yeah. I, I mean, for for that band to sound this good this many years later, I mean, that that's the real thing. Yeah, it, that record, you know, it's like I was like, OK, it's about time because <laughs> it was well, same with Liquid Soul, really. I yeah. should, it's it's kind of the same thing. It's almost the same amount of time. But uh that you know the furs we've been playing continuously for i mean i got back in the band uh 17 years ago mm -hmm. um because i took a a leave of absence for a while um and we've played every year we've done tours of, you know three tours a year or something like that so the band sounded at the point where this record it makes sense that it happened now because the band sounds great it really does live the first shows have so much energy it's uh it, the band just sounds great it's 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 incredible right now last time i saw the first was a couple of years ago and i'm watching richard butler sing and the fact that his voice holds up and is as powerful as it was in 1981 it is mind blowing. I, I just I stood there in front of the stage, slack jawed, watching the band play. And you're right. This this is a band that just it, it, they really are as good as it gets. I love the cycle. Yeah. And we're having a good time, which is you know when I I mean in the '80s we were having a good time too, but it was a little darker. You know, <laughs> the whole vibe of the band was a little dark, and I think that was kind of what we were getting across back then too you know i mean that's what the band was you know it was the period did people approach you and say can you play the opening of heartbeat yes <laughs> I had a you know i should actually I, I should probably figure out a way to do heartbeat with liquid salt because i think it would work 
that this can't be the first time you had that thought. I, I have thought about it, but then, you know, it's like, well, can we do it instrumental? Maybe we could turn it into a whole different thing. But uh, it's, I mean, it's a dance tune, you know, it's a, uh, it's got funky vibe to it. It's got a oh, yeah. rock vibe. It's, it's kind of what I like to do is like mix different things together, you know, layer styles. And that in essence, to bring it right back, that in essence is liquid soul, uh, volume one, lost soul volume one, which means yeah. there is more to come. And hopefully when we emerge from all this, when we enter the post-vaccination era, the, the thought of seeing you guys live again is very exciting. Yeah. And the fact that this is liquid soul is still with us. gives me, gives me great joy. So knock wood, fingers crossed. In the meantime, we can hear what you sound like. Uh, again, on Lost Soul Volume 1, which just popped up recently. And it, my God, what, what a fun testament that is to your band. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on here. It's great talking with you.